where I live up in Fullerton is a cute neighborhood near downtown. It's a pretty vibrant mixed income area. Last Sunday, the day before Halloween, the ice cream truck that's parked a few houses away from my condo complex made a horrifying change of music <laughs> from La Cucaracha to Christmas carols. <laughs> Beyond the grating, unneighborly noise of an ice cream truck, the musical adjustment reminded me that we are about to make the very rapid dive into the holidays. That means a lot of things. It means food and social engagements and special charity events and decorations, of course. Perhaps most of all, it means memories a combination of joyous and painful holiday memories are delivered to our doorstep this time of year. The requisite holiday nostalgia makes for a rich, if not complicated, time of year, triggered by songs or smells or by seeing family, we're thrust into this bizarre archaeological dig, uncovering long-lost layers of previous ages and phases of life. This month, as you have heard, the theme in our worship service is remembrance. Today, in particular, we're focusing on memory. And we normally think of memory as something that comes to us. Yet, we aren't completely passive consumers of those replayed stories. We have some choice in how we review and maybe avoid certain memories, or maybe hold on really tightly to others. So I want to suggest maybe a different way, maybe a middle way of addressing them. You've probably noticed by now that in meditation, a large chunk of what goes on is paying attention to the breath. Believe it or not, there is care to be taken in the amount of effort that you put in noticing the breath. I've heard translations of the Buddha's instruction that say, breathing in, be aware that you're breathing in, and breathing out, be aware that you're breathing out. Those words, be aware, are specific. You could say focus on the breath, but focus suggests an effort and a pressure. Concentrate is certainly way too intense of a word. All we're told to do is be aware. When I try to describe this amount of effort, sometimes I talk about physical touch. We certainly don't want to grab a hold tightly as we focus on the breath. The more useful way of noticing the breath is a gentle touch, as if touching one finger just enough to notice something is there. You might also think of it as gently laying a hand on someone's shoulder. There's no force. There's no holding back. It's a relaxed state. Breathing in, be aware that you're breathing in, and breathing out, be aware that you're breathing out. That level of engagement, this being aware, has uses that go beyond breathing and meditation. It can also be helpful in ways we navigate our memories that arise. I invite you this season, as the memories come, to allow yourself the same level of attention. Simply be aware of those memories, not denying them and not grasping too tightly to the good ones either. Just notice and accept them for what they are. Clinging too tightly will always disappoint they are memories. They are gone. And pushing them away, trying to deny them, takes so much work, and it never works. So as they arrive, the good ones and the bad and the confusing, just notice them and be aware. Of course, memories aren't just about holidays. In some 
ways they shape our lives. There's this exercise that I've noticed often comes up in UU adult religious education curricula. It's usually called something like drawing your spiritual map or defining spiritual stepping stones. I think it's a useful exercise for everyone. Your spiritual map or your stepping stones identify those moments in life that brought you to where you are today through shaping your character and clarifying your beliefs. It's not just about a static memory. Creating a map acknowledges the pivot points that defined the course of who we are still becoming. So I'll share with you a little bit of my map today as an encouragement for you to go home and think through your own defining moments. One of the first stones in my journey has to be my home congregation. I grew up attending All Souls Unitarian Church in Tulsa. It's one of the largest UU churches in the country. The last time I checked, which was years ago, they had about 1,800 members. Yeah. Um, I was there every time the door opened. Um, it seemed a little odd at the time, but it makes a lot more sense now. Like many of our older congregations, this church copied New England-style architecture. It was simple and elegant. And since I left, there have been renovations and additions to the building, but it still looks and feels the same as it did in the 90s. That is to say, as soon as I walk through the doors, I feel like I'm back at home. So many, so many of my vivid memories of childhood and youth are in that building. Now I realize that being there was the foundation for this sort of growing religiosity in me. I cultivated an appreciation for ritual and tradition and music and being together. Later in my teens, the church and Unitarian Universalism became synonymous with a safe space for me. It was a place that I could be out as a young gay person without a second thought. And that was truly a saving grace in Oklahoma in the 90s. <laughs> Looking back, it's funny how unaware I was in those days of how much it was shaping me. Another stepping stone on my journey would be backpacking with my family in the Rocky Mountains. We went every year around Labor Day weekend, starting when I was, think I was nine years old. I was way too young, really. Later, I was involved in adventures with the Boy Scouts, but it was the earliest backpacking trips that really made the impression that stuck. Those trips gave me an awareness of the beauty and the adventure and the bonding and the sense of belonging that can happen in nature. I remember campfires and sleeping crowded with the family in one tent and hot chocolate on cold mornings in the mountains, long hikes and afternoon rains. It was really magical. One of the more difficult stepping stones for me had to do with the murder of Matthew Shepard. He was just two years older than me when he was killed. I was a college student at the time, very involved in LGBT activism on campus and liberal campus ministry. I remember where I was when I heard the news that he had been killed. Even more vividly, I remember the vigil that we held on campus. I had called all of the clergy that I knew in our little college town. Whether they were not available or not willing to lead us in our time of fear is uncertain. What was clear was that we were left as students without spiritual leadership from adults. So I organized the vigil with a couple of friends and hundreds of people showed up with candles. As a sophomore in college, I did what I could to cobble together some readings and some songs to create sacred space. 
And something about that night showed me that I would be called on to sometimes do leadership that others were not able or willing to do. And I don't say that to pat myself on the back. It was actually really, really scary time for a young gay kid. Another piece of the map that was made clear was starting about 15 years ago, around the time I started ministry. That was the time I first was contacted by my birth family. I had been adopted as an infant and always knew I was adopted. It wasn't until they contacted me at the age of 28 that I knew anything about them, really. Meeting them didn't change the course of my life so much, but it made some of the pieces make sense and make them more clear. In getting to know them, I realized that the big, a few big pieces of my personality came from biological family, pieces that were very different from my adopted family. Genetics, I will tell you, affect a whole lot more than your eye color and your height. <laughs> Making that connection also gave a sense of relief for tension that I didn't even know was there before. It, gave an opportunity to let each other know that things had turned out okay. It was a huge relief for them to know that my adoption I, and my family and my growing up had all been pretty charmed, if I'm honest. And it was a relief for me to find that I came from kind, hardworking people. It didn't change the trajectory, but it helped put some of the puzzle pieces together. And the most recent point in my journey is the one that you, for better or worse, hear the most about. It's cultivating a meditation practice. If I had to locate a particular moment or place, I would say that the practice took root on my couch in Laguna Beach. Meditation was a lifeline for maintaining my sanity in the midst of a very messy relationship and some very difficult growing challenges. That was at least 10 years ago. More recently, I started leading the mindfulness meditation sessions here at Tapestry during COVID. I was reminded of what a resource it has been for me for quite a while. So these are all pieces of my life that I have talked about in previous sermons. I apologize if those stories come off as jarring when I tell them so quickly, but they're the milestones to get out there. I told them quickly today because it in some ways is old news. Still, they're pieces that I bring with me to every Sunday. That's because they're the stepping stones, which raises the question, what are yours? What are the pieces of your journey that you bring with you every Sunday or everywhere that you go? What does your spiritual map look like? What are the waypoints? Closely related to memory, one of the things that I've been hearing a lot about recently, and you may have too, is trauma. I've particularly heard a lot of the phrase trauma-informed. There's trauma-informed healthcare, trauma-informed education, trauma-informed yoga. And as I learned this week, there's a whole conversation going on about trauma-informed ministry. It's jargon that's a little bit overused right now because it's very popular, but still, I found one description really helpful. It said that in trauma-informed care, I think this was from a hospital in particular, rather than asking what's wrong with you, we ask what happened to you. Rather than asking what's wrong with a person, we ask what happened to them. Before we even consider what that means for our actions, it opens up some really interesting possibilities for our first principle. 
The first of our seven UU principles says that we covenant to affirm and promote the inherent worth and dignity of every person. Sometimes that worth and dignity is really hard to see in other people. And sometimes we don't do the best job of recognizing our own inherent worth and dignity. Sometimes it even appears that there's something wrong, something fundamentally broken. Reframing the question, what's wrong with you, to what happened to you, opens up a world of possibilities, stretching our sense of compassion and understanding. As I learned this week, trauma is a pretty broad term. It includes any experiences that are emotionally disturbing or life-threatening that cause a lasting impact on mental, physical, emotional health. Mostly we think of them as physical, sexual, emotional abuse, but it can also be neglect, or living with family members with mental illness or addiction issues, or sudden separation from a loved one, or poverty, or racism, or discrimination, oppression, violence in your community. It's a huge spectrum. And research says that about 62% of American adults were exposed to at least one form of that in childhood. About 25% of American adults navigated three or more forms of that in childhood. That's a whole lot of people who have been seriously negatively impacted by their experience. It probably includes many of us in this room or on Zoom today, and still others who have not stepped foot in tapestry yet. Perhaps we can learn to stop asking this question of what's wrong with that person to get curious about what happened to them. Memory is fascinating stuff. Mostly we consider ourselves as passive consumers of memories, but this week I hope we can start to consider ourselves not just as victims of our past or being puppets of our past, really. I hope that we can become editors of it and storytellers. We can take a broad view and notice the wide array of pieces of our past that we have access to. We can ponder the most impactful pieces that make us who we are. And when the memories are not good, when they are in fact traumatic, we can push back and work at healing them together. Amen.